Our sermon text this morning is from 1 Kings 16, beginning with verse 29 through chapter 17, verse 7. We continue in our study of the divided kingdoms of Israel and Judah, and this morning our reading again is 1 Kings 16, 29 through 17, 7. Listen now as I read, for this is the very word of God. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the sons of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, and he built in Samaria, which he built in Samaria, and Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days, Hiel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of Abiram, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishba in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him. Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Kareth, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did, according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Kareth, that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. After a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. May the Lord bless to our hearts and minds the reading of his word. And you may be seated. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we pray that by the power of your Spirit, you would work through the ministry of your Word to give us strength and dependence on you, that we might stand firm in significant and often evil days. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, in his classic work, Macbeth, William Shakespeare offers us one of the most memorable lines in all of English literature. As the three witches prepare to meet the victorious Macbeth, as he returns from battle, one of the witches utters, by the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. As one Shakespeare commentator has noted, the line is a very striking piece of verse, not only because of the way it sounds but also because of its ominous announcement of some approaching monster. And of course, for Shakespeare, the monster is Macbeth himself, right? Who will go on to obtain the throne through murder and will essentially be driven into madness by his own guilt, vanity, and pride. Well, this morning, as we turn our attention to the end of 1 Kings 16, the text is essentially giving us a similar ominous announcement. Something wicked this way comes. And not just something wicked, but something altogether significant, weighty, charged with import. To to fully grasp the significance of what we are entering into in these coming chapters, consider this. From the, the time period, from the division of the kingdom after Solomon to the fall of Jerusalem is a period of about 344 years. And in 1 and 2 Kings, these 344 years are covered by 36 chapters of text. However, beginning with Ahab and and his rise to power at the end of chapter 16, the next 36 years, which covers the reign of Ahab and his two sons, Uh, that 36-year period will occupy the next 17 chapters of text. Let that sink in for a moment. Almost half 
of all the biblical text covering the divided kingdom focuses in on this 36-year period. To put it a little differently, right? The next 16 and a half chapters of 1st and 2nd Kings, which will take us through the rest of 2021 to preach through, it will actually cover less historical time than last week's sermon. So obviously, the author of 1st and 2nd Kings, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, felt this particular period of history In Israel, in Judah, it was and it is of great significance. And clearly, that that, that significance is out of proportion with its brevity. So knowing this, the keen reader ought to sit up at this point and take some special notice of what is to come. For the sheer weight of the text is whispering to us, something significant this way comes. And the reason for this additional weight, the the reason for this added significance is is twofold. And we are introduced to both of those aspects in our text this morning. The, The first reason for this added significance, as we've already alluded to, is that we are about to engage a greater evil than we have previously experienced. With Ahab's rise to power, in a way that is greater and deeper than anything we have experienced so far in 1 Kings, something wicked this way comes. And we are introduced to this evil, this wickedness, in chapter 16, verses 29 through 34. And then the second component of the significance of this time period is introduced to us in chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. For what we see is that in the face of this unprecedented evil... God raises up a prophetic ministry that is above and beyond anything we have seen before in our study. The next three decades of Israel's life as a nation will be marked by the ministries of Elijah and Elisha just as much as the reign of wicked King Ahab. So what we are really entering into here is a season of extended showdown. The wicked kings of Ahab and his sons set against the great prophetic ministries of Elijah and Elisha. And here in our text this morning, the great showdown begins. To start with, as I have already alluded to, we're introduced to Ahab. And in chapter 16, verses 29 through 34, we are given a general synopsis of Ahab's reign. And then we're given a few specifics to support that synopsis, right? So we have a synopsis with specific support. Let's consider that. The synopsis of Ahab's reign is found in verses 30 and 33. We begin reading in verse 29. It says, in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. And then we get the synopsis of those 22 years in verse 30. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And then, just in case you kind of had dozed off for a second and you missed the point, the author reasserts it in verse 33. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Now, just a couple considerations on this point. Uh, This is not like coming in last at the Olympic 100-meter dash and being called the slowest guy in the race. You could console yourself in that case by saying, well, I'm, I'm still pretty fast. No, this is being the worst of a very bad bunch. I remind you, every single king of the northern kingdom of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Every single king of Israel provoked the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger. They were all evil. There was not one good king among them. They were an idolatrous, murderous bunch from beginning to end. So to have the title of most evil among this bunch is a special kind of dishonor. And you should know, this is not a title that the author of First and Second Kings throws around lightly. In fact, he only uses the title on one other occasion, and that is for Omri, Ahab's father, right? 
We read last week in chapter 1625 that Omri did more evil than all who were before him. And yet Omri doesn't get to hold the title of most wicked king ever for very long, does he? Because his own son Ahab outdoes his father's evil. And yet, after Ahab, his title never gets used again for the kings of Israel. When the northern kingdom of Israel is destroyed later on, never to be reestablished, Ahab still holds the title. A title that he will hold in infamy forever. He's the most evil, the most divine anger-provoking king that Israel ever had. So that gives us some indication of why the author of First and Second Kings slows the narrative down at this point and focuses so much attention on the reign of one king because he is the worst king that Israel ever had. But that then prompts us to ask, well, what's so bad about Ahab? Like, what did he do to distinguish himself as uniquely and particularly evil? Well, we're going to spend the next few months exploring many of Ahab's evil deeds as they unfold in the coming chapters. But the text here mentions a couple of specific evil deeds that in many ways summarize Ahab's reign. The text, in fact, gives us four specific deeds that highlight Ahab's reign. The first is that he committed the sin of Jeroboam. Now, of course, this is not unique to evil, a unique evil to Ahab, because every king of Israel committed the sins of Jeroboam. But this was, in fact, then the foundation of Ahab's evil. So just a quick reminder, the sin of Jeroboam was that Jeroboam created a false man-made system of worship. Jeroboam made golden calves. He appointed his own priests who were not Levites. He created his own temples and his own altars, and he established his own feast days. And it's important to note, the Scripture does not hesitate to call the sin of Jeroboam idolatry and evil. However, as it relates to Ahab, it it would perhaps be more accurate to call the religious system of Jeroboam an intentional corruption of biblical worship rather than a wholesale repudiation of the God of Israel and the story of Israel's redemption. We see this if we go back to 1 Kings 12 when Jeroboam first built his golden calves. He announced to the people, you've gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. You see, Jeroboam was trying to build his own religious system, but he was at least trying to build his system around the great Exodus event. He was trying to center and kind of recenter, yet off-center, the people around the great story of their redemption from slavery in Egypt by by the hand of God. He did not reject that story outright. He simply corrupted it. And again, it's very clear in First and Second Kings that Jeroboam's man-made corruption of the true story of God's redemption of Israel, that corruption was still evil. It still provoked the Lord to anger. It still brought divine judgment and death and destruction to all the kings who walked in it. And Ahab would be no exception. This sin of Jeroboam was part of Ahab's evil. However, as we see from the text, there is actually something worse than the sin of Jeroboam. And Ahab, sadly, was just getting warmed up. This brings us to the second evil deed of Ahab. The text says, as if it was a light thing, right? As if it wasn't evil enough for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took his for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and served Baal and worshipped him. Now we're going to learn a lot more about Jezebel in the coming chapters, but suffice it to say, she may be the most wicked woman in all of Scripture. She was an open enemy of the God of Israel, and she was a passionate advocate for Baal worship. Baal, as many of you will know, was a Canaanite fertility god, and he was considered the god of the storm. 
And under the influence of Jezebel, Ahab made Baal worship central to Israel's life as a nation. So this was not just a case where Israel had kind of corrupted worship of the God of Israel, you know, with some contraband worship of other gods on the side. No, this was a deliberate decision to engage in the wholesale replacement of the God of Israel with another god. Under Ahab and Jezebel, Baal worship became central, not peripheral. And this is seen then in the third specific evil that is mentioned here. The text says Ahab erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. He built it. And Ahab made an Asherah, who was the female goddess counterpart to Baal. You see, Ahab didn't invent Baal worship, but whereas perhaps in the past you might have had some high places out on the countryside of Israel where false gods were worshipped outside the purview of the capital, Ahab actually built a house for Baal worship in the capital city of Samaria. So you can see that Ahab and Jezebel, they were taking idolatry in Israel to a new level. Or to put it differently, they, they represented a new low in the evil of Israel's monarchy. And then, in addition to these deeds, the text adds one final insult to Ahab's injury against Israel. And that is this. The text says, In Ahab's days, Hiel of Bethel built Jericho and laid its foundation. And then it says, This happened at the cost of Abiram, his firstborn, and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub. Now, this requires a bit of explanation, right? If we turn back to Joshua chapter 6, we see that when the Canaanite city of Jericho was destroyed by the Lord at the famous Battle of Jericho, Joshua uttered a curse against anyone who would ever attempt to rebuild the city on the site of its destruction. Joshua 6.26 reads, Joshua laid an oath on them at that time, saying, Cursed before the Lord be the man who rises up and rebuilds this city of Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. Now what seems to be going on here is that under Ahab, as a kind of direct rebellion against this well-known word, Hiel of Bethel sought to rebuild Jerusalem and lost his two sons in the process. Now scholars are a little bit divided on what happened to those two sons. Many scholars argue that the death of Heel's two sons actually came about through human sacrifice, which was common in Canaanite worship. This would argue that what Heel was doing was really sacrificing his two sons in order to kind of evoke, arouse, and establish Baal's blessing on this new city of Jericho. It was, in essence, an attempt to have Baal revoke and triumph over the curse of Joshua. Others have said, well, no, that's not necessarily true, but it's altogether possible that that they just went ahead building the city. The sons were struck down in judgment, but yet it didn't stop them. They pressed on anyway in order to rebuild the city. In either case, it is clear this wicked endeavor of Heel simply fulfilled the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. And all of it together serves to show that Ahab's sin was deep and broad. His rejection of the God of Israel was comprehensive, and that rejection bore itself out in destructive and abominable behavior, both in Ahab and in those under his charge. Ahab is a kind of sober reminder to us that when things are bad, and they were bad before Omri, things got worse under Omri, but when things are bad, they can always get worse. Do you think society is evil now? It can get worse. It's a fearful thought that should drive us to desperate prayer. And yet we also must know as we pray that if and when things get worse, the Lord always sees. And his holy, righteous anger is provoked in just proportion 
to the evil that takes place. Well, as we move from chapter 16 into chapter 17, we also see that that though Ahab's evil is great, and though God's anger against him is great, God's redemptive response to Ahab's evil is also great. God's great response here in our text and in the coming chapters is the raising up of Elijah, a man who will exercise a prophetic ministry of special significance. If you've been following along our study so far, you'll know that so far in the kingdom of Israel, what we have seen from the prophets is really what you might call great prophetic moments. God has raised up a prophet to utter a specific word to a specific person at a specific time, and then generally that prophet has passed from the scene. But here with Elijah, and then subsequently with Elisha, what we see are extended prophetic ministries. And really, not since Moses has the Scripture revealed uh, an encounter with, uh, with this kind of extended prophetic ministry like we will see in these two men. So here in the opening verses of chapter 17, we are introduced to the great prophet Elijah. His name means, my God is Yahweh, which is the Lord in all capital letters. He's called Elijah the Tishbite of Tishba, which is probably the name of Elijah's hometown. We say probably because uh, Tishba is a place that no one has any knowledge of. There's no other mention of it anywhere except in a few references in the Scripture to Elijah himself. So I think it's fair to say, if this is his hometown, which it probably is, It's a place of uh, no reputation with no political significance because it's not mentioned anywhere in any other biblical or non-biblical writing. But what the lack of reputation, this lack of reputation, it does not hinder Elijah's boldness as he goes forth in ministry. We see that he begins his public ministry with a confrontational word of divine judgment In verse 1, we read, he goes to Ahab and he says to the king, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. A couple of things to note then about this confrontational word. Number one, it's it's a word of direct confrontation with Baal. Baal, as I mentioned earlier, was considered to be the God of the storm. He was responsible in Canaanite theology for bringing rain and subsequent fertility to crops. And what's interesting is that even within the theology of Baal, if you want to call it that, Baal was not considered to be an ever-living God. He lived during the rainy season and he was dead during the dry season. And He was thought to be reborn each season as Baal worshippers enacted cultic prostitution as part of their worship. But Elijah will have none of that, will he? Now, in the face of this dead God who needs his worshipers to arouse him to live, Elijah proclaims that the God of Israel, the Lord, lives in season and out of season. And this living Lord lives in judgment over Baal by the power of his word, by God's command. Baal is not going to be bringing any storm. Elijah is essentially announcing that the living word of the living Lord renders Baal dead and impotent. And this word that Elijah offers is not just a word against Baal, it's also a word of fearless confrontation against Ahab himself. Elijah stands before King Ahab and announces, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand. It's as if for Elijah, in the presence of the Lord, standing before King Ahab is but an afterthought. Ahab's presence does not matter, does not influence Elijah, for Elijah stands before the heavenly king, the Lord, the God of Israel. You might say that Elijah's confrontational word here is offered in the spirit of Isaiah 40, in which Isaiah writes, the Lord brings princes to nothing. He makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. 
Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown. Scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. Elijah here stands before the king and he announces to Ahab that Israel will become a dry parched land. And in doing so, he acknowledges the only king who really matters, the Lord, the God of Israel. And finally then, we see Elijah's word. It's not just a word of confrontation with Baal. It's not just a word of confrontation with Ahab. But it's really a word of confrontation for the whole of the people of Israel. And this is because if we turn back to Deuteronomy eleven sixteen, 16, we read there that God declared to the entire nation of Israel, take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain, and the land will yield no fruit, and you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord is giving you. Israel had indeed turned to other gods under the leadership of their evil king. And so now Elijah announces that the judgment of God is going to fall on the whole land. This will happen by the authority of Elijah's word, and it will happen in accordance with the word that God spoke through Moses. Oh, make no mistake, this is meant to get our attention. A great prophet has arisen. He speaks a great word against great evil. And this word of divine confrontation against Baal and Ahab and Israel, it is a reminder to us all of the great power of God. To be sure, the power to shut up the heavens does not come from Elijah himself. As James 5 tells us very clearly, Elijah was a man like us, with a nature like ours. And yet, through the humble ministry of Elijah's word and prayer, the Lord worked this great work. Through the humble ministry of one man's word and prayer, the Lord will bring the mighty kingdom of Ahab to its knees. And as we will continue to see, this is how the Lord so often chooses to work, right? He often chooses to manifest His great power through human weakness. But as we observe that weakness, we should not for a moment underestimate the awesome power of God present in and through His Word. Well, having spoken this awesome word of divine confrontation, we then see that Elijah receives a word of divine protection and provision. You can be sure that Elijah's prophetic announcement did not sit well with Ahab and Jezebel. And so for Elijah's own protection, the word of the Lord comes to him and announces, depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Kareth, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Now to be sure, this is a, this is a hard word, right? The, the wilderness that the Lord was sending Elijah into was a harsh place. And the prospect of being supernaturally fed by ravens, who were not even clean animals, was a lot to swallow. No pun intended. But we see that Elijah believes the Lord, and he obeys his word. He went and did, the text says, according to the word of the Lord. And this, as we have seen in our past studies, is not always the case with the prophets, is it? Sometimes they bring the rebuking word of the Lord to others, but do not obey the word of the Lord in their own lives. But Elijah does not just speak the word of the Lord, he does according to the word of the Lord. And in his obedience, the Lord then provides for him with abundance. The ravens feed him bread and meat both morning and evening. And this is indeed abundant provision. Some of you may recall in previous readings that when Israel was in the wilderness after coming out of Egypt, God fed them with bread and meat once a day. But here he feeds Elijah a double portion. It's a demonstration of abundant provision. In a time of great need, it's a, it's a, 
it's a, it's a wonderful picture of the great spiritual principle that Carlton preached on last week in the evening, Philippians 4.19. My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And yet what we see is that this abundant provision soon gives way to a, a surprising trial occasioned by prophetic obedience. You see, after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. This is rather striking, right, for, for Elijah because this is coming about as a result of his prophetic obedience, right? The initial act of prophetic obedience was him offering, offering this confrontational word regarding drought that he spoke to Ahab. And then the subsequent act of prophetic obedience was him going into the wilderness in order to be dependent on this brook. These acts of obedience have now led Elijah to a place of great vulnerability. And now it is life-threatening vulnerability. The brook has dried up. Why did that happen? Because of the very word that Elijah has spoken. And the reason Elijah is dependent on this particular brook is because that's where the Lord sent him, and he received that word and obeyed. Elijah's life is now in danger, not because of some kind of sin on his part, but actually because of his obedience. And if we just read our verses for this morning, we, we don't really see any resolution to Elijah's dilemma. We don't see how the Lord intervenes. We have no indication of what the Lord's purposes are for Elijah in all of this. But rest assured, we can know even this morning, and we will certainly see in subsequent chapters, that the Lord knows what He is doing. The Lord is working His purposes out, both for Elijah's good and for the good of His people. But the very fact that it is Elijah's bold obedience which leads him into this trial is another reminder that God often, and we might even say more often than not, chooses to accomplish His mighty works through our weakness, our trial, and even our suffering. The Lord often works His might in us, and as we'll see in subsequent weeks, God is definitely doing a work in Elijah, for Elijah's own sanctification, for Elijah's own spiritual good. God is pleased to do His work in us and pleased to do work through us to others through weakness, vulnerability, and suffering. God often brings us to a a hard place in our obedience where we have nothing but Him. And in that place, He delights to make His strength perfect in our weakness. So fear not. And if you're not convinced merely by the story of Elijah, then we look ahead. Because nowhere do we see this more clearly than the life of the ultimate prophet, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, like Elijah, was bold in speaking confrontational words of judgment against those in authority, against those who misused their authority over God's people. Jesus Jesus was not afraid of other gods. He was not afraid of earthly rulers. He was not afraid of the will of the people. No, he lived in accordance with the Word of God, trusting in his Father's provision at every turn. Trusting the Father for daily bread and for all of His needs. And like Elijah, Jesus' obedience often brought Him into times of trial and danger. Jesus was vulnerable because of His obedience to the pangs of death. And unlike Elijah, Jesus was ultimately not spared from death. But in obedience to the word of his father, he actually went to the cross where he suffered and died for all our sins. Jesus died. He paid the penalty for all the times that we fall into idolatry. For all the times that we willingly embrace evil. For all the times we spurn the warning of God's word and try to build our own little kingdoms in our own little ways. 
Christ died for all the ways that we fear the power of the world and cower before their threats instead of standing boldly in the presence of the living God. Jesus died for all the times we just don't trust in the Lord's provision and instead wander into reliance on the world and engage in all manner of disobedience. See, Jesus died for all that. He paid the penalty for all our sins. And as we look to the cross, we see that Jesus is the ultimate expression of God's strength displayed in human weakness, vulnerability, and suffering even unto death. But of course, Jesus did not remain in the grave. God the Father raised Jesus from the dead, defeating all the powers of evil, so that now all who believe in Christ, we not only find forgiveness for our sin, but we now find strength in Christ to walk in new obedience. And so in Christ, we find the strength to submit to the authority of God's Word, to trust in God's provision for all our needs. And to stand firm and bold against the power of evil. Oh, make no mistake, Elijah was a great man. His prophetic ministry was in many ways unique. But again, he was a man, the scripture says, with a nature like ours. Which means that through faith in Christ, we can actually live with the spiritual power and conviction of Elijah. And this is important because the days that we live in, they are significant days. I would argue that there are no more significant days in any of our lives than in the days that are before us. For each and every one of us, something significant this way comes. And I have no doubt that in these significant days, we will have to face great evil. Perhaps greater evil than we have ever faced before. And yet fear not, because by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of his death and resurrection, by the power of his indestructible life, the the power that is at work in the ministry of Elijah is at work in the people of God today. And by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, may God enable us to walk in boldness before the world and utter dependence on the living word of the living God. May we cling to Christ for strength and dependence in all things, and God will provide. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we we lament that we live in a world full of great evil, evil that we need to be rescued from, And we lament that our hearts are actually filled with great evil, evil that we need to be rescued from. And we praise you that the word of your gospel has been announced concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the only one who can save us from the world and from ourselves. We pray that we would turn to him in faith and that as your church, we would be bold in the face of worldly evil, and we would be dependent on you in all things. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.